competitive as you start out in the first few chapters, but you know, sometimes we just need to hear the same thing over and over and over, and God wants to drive certain points home about who we should be with and who we should not be with. And he, he treats us like children in the sense that this is instruction written from a father to children. And in the same way, to be saved, you need to humble yourself as a child and have faith just as much as your children. Do not doubt that you're going to feed them. We also need to not doubt that God will save us. And the wisdom of God that we see in Proverbs here is very much written from a father to a child. Listen, do what I say and you will live. Listen, do what I say and you'll be safe. Look out for these bad things. I'm warning you about the bad things in life. And most parents will attest that they have made mistakes in life. And those mistakes, they want to not boast of the mistake. Look, we don't glory in our shame, right? But you want to warn children about the error of going down certain paths. And we see that here. Look at verse number one, starting from the very beginning. Proverbs chapter four, verse number one. Hear ye, children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. So this one specifically is written from a father. He says, pay attention. Dad is telling you something. There's something you need to learn here. Look at the next verse. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law. Listen, this is the instruction of a father saying, I'm going to give you some doctrine. There is doctrine I want you to have. And this is the number one goal of a parent for children is to be able to teach them good doctrine. Listen, the number one goal of every Christian parent should be number one, that they get saved. Right? Maybe number two and three should be that they, they serve the Lord with their life, that they're soul winners, that they're righteous in God's eyes, that they try to live for God and worry about pleasing God more than they do pleasing their boss, pleasing the world, pleasing their friends, even more than pleasing you, mom and dad. Your children need to be worried about pleasing God. And God has put you over them in authority as a picture of the authority that God has over us all. So, you know, we need to be righteous. We need to be a good example. And that's sort of the, the end game. You know, the Bible says that we should bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We need to nurture and love them and we need to admonish them. We need to correct them and, and exhort them. We need to tell them when they're doing wrong. So there's, that's a two-sided coin. But it says good doctrine. That, the phrase doctrine is used throughout the Bible. And today, in 2018, doctrine divides. Well, you Baptists and your doctrine, you're so worried about dividing. Yes, we are. Hey, thank God for it. We do want to divide between light and dark. That's what Jesus did. We're not afraid to divide between man and woman. That's what God did on, on, in the beginning when he created man and woman. We're not ashamed of that. Hey, there are certain stances we take. It's because we want to divide based on doctrine. Listen, there are certain things God says that we should not even be around. If you're a Christian and you want to be in God's will, don't be around them. Divide, separate yourself, sanctify yourself, be prepared to be used of God. And it starts when you learn doctrine. If you don't know doctrine, then it's easy for you to go in error. Yeah. There are a lot of worthless Christians that don't know what the Bible says. And I think a lot of them, you know, the Bible says we have the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth, right? He'll show us things to come. I believe the Holy Spirit warns these Christians and grieves their heart and tries to tell them where they're at, it's wrong. But they also need to hear the doctrine. They need to see it for themselves. They need to put it in their heart to protect their very lives. Hey, once you're saved, nothing can change that. Nothing can cause you to be sent to hell. But there's all sorts of stuff that can cause you to be corrected of God. And not knowing doctrine will not withhold the correction. You're going to be corrected for going against God's doctrine. He says, forsake ye not my law. Listen, whether you know the law or not, whether you've seen it recently or you sort of have a suspicion it's wrong to do certain things, when you break God's law, He will correct you. He loves you. He wants you to be good children. He wants you to be good examples. He wants you to help others. And if you're intentionally breaking His law, He can't use you. Why would He choose you? He would much rather choose somebody that's humble enough to admit that they're wrong in, in, against God's law. Look, today we need to learn good doctrine. The fathers in this church, it's your responsibility in your household to instruct your wife, your children, according to good doctrine, biblical doctrine. You know, in 1 Timothy 4, he says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. 
Well, how long should we learn doctrine until Jesus comes back? Should I read my Bible every day? Well, you don't have to read it every day, just until the day of the Lord. So I guess that is every day, right? In 2 Timothy 3, he says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Every bit of this book is good for your doctrine. Well, even the Psalms, even Song of Solomon, that's romantic. Yes, there's doctrine in Song of Solomon. There's doctrine in Ecclesiastes. There's doctrine all throughout the Bible, and it's for your profit if you would learn it. He says, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Instruction in righteousness. The Word of God has the doctrine to instruct you on how to do the right thing. Listen, and many Christians have, have, have conferred, hey, you know, there was a time in my life where I did the wrong thing and I kept doing the wrong thing, and I sure wish I had somebody telling me I was doing wrong. I wish somebody would have opened the Bible and warned me not to go down that path, not to hang out with those people, not to make those mistakes. Well, that's what we're doing today. Yeah. I'm going to show you what God says out of Proverbs. Men, you take it home. You show it to your wives. Men, you instruct them and teach them good doctrine. Moms, you share it with your children day by day by day, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, and these children will be weaned and ready to instruct the world. They'll be ready to go out and fight against the world while standing on good doctrine. This is the goal of Proverbs. The instruction of a father should be good doctrine from dad, from God. Dad, in lieu of God, is going to teach the children, this is right, this is wrong. And that doesn't happen today. Instead, today, many, many parents just totally delegate this to the public school system, to the television. I've seen Christian families talk, well, you know, I said this, and then my child said, oh, I couldn't believe what my child said. Well, guess what? You raised them on the TV. You let that television be their standard of morals. When your child back talks to you and tells you you're wrong, when you try to stand on the Bible, well, guess what? That's what you've built. Instead of building the doctrine based on the Bible, you allowed them to learn whatever they want to learn from the TV, and when they give you a hard time one day, you're going to know why. I think there's, there's many parents that are in this situation where there's rebellion in their house because they've allowed the TV to be the instructor of doctrine. Listen, Dad, that's your job. If you don't do it, somebody else will. Understand this. If you don't teach your children, somebody else will. If you don't instruct your children, if you don't tell them that God is their authority, that they have to answer to God, somebody else will put another authority in lieu of God. Dads, it's your responsibility to instruct them in good doctrine. Look at verse number 3. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the, in the sight of my mother. What's he saying here? He's saying, I'm a daddy's boy, but what does that mean? I was tender in mama's eyes, but not daddy's. What's he saying here? Dad treated me like a man. He didn't treat me like a wimp. Like I was soft. He didn't, Dad treated me like a man. Not weak. Dad strengthened me. That's the goal. Hey, and you know, as a dad, that's your responsibility to do that in all aspects of life. Thou shalt teach them, by the way. Teach them what? Everything. About God. About life. About how to be a man. About how to be a hard worker. About how to learn finances. Dad, that's your responsibility. I didn't ask for permission, but I'm going to use Brother Luke because he was telling me earlier, I've been working all day. I've been screwing I've been 400 screws into the floor today. Hey, praise the Lord, his dad. Hey, you could call it slave labor if you want. I call it good instruction. Amen. I call it the dad strengthening the son and teaching him how to work with his hands. Amen. Do you know how many grown men don't know how to use a drill? Don't know how to use a hammer? And look, there's more to life than using those things, obviously, but as a dad, you ought to instruct in all aspects of life, prepare them for life, so that no matter where they end up, they're ready to do good, to do the best job that they can. Amen. I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. Old mama said, poor Luke, his arms, daddy said, make him do another hundred. Right? <laughs> That's the way it ought to be. Look, look at verse number four. He taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words Keep my commandments and live. He's saying, hey, son, listen to these commandments. Listen to this law. Let your heart retain my words. The word heart is mentioned several times in this chapter. Consider the way that it's applied as we hit it in the next few places. But he's saying, what do you want me to put in the heart? What dad said. What dad taught. 
There are certain things that my dad, my dad growing up when we were teenagers, I remember if he ever caught us with our, our hands in our pocket, my brother and I, he would get us. He would get us one way or another. He said, that is not something we're allowed to do. Even to this day, I'm almost 40, and I'm like, wait, whoop, whoop, dad looking? You know what I mean? It's a habit. When, when you go to do it, and they're like, wait a minute, dad told me not to do that. Well, that's good. My dad instilled something in me. Is it directly a sin if I put my hands in my pocket? No. The point is, my dad didn't want me to be lazy. My dad wanted me to be upright, and he took every opportunity to apply these things in my life. I put that in my heart. It's always with me what my dad taught me. Those are very important. Saying, yes, sir. Again, is it a sin if my kids don't say yes, sir, no, sir? No, I wouldn't say it's a sin. I think it's good practice. I think it's good to have manners and, and instruct your children to show respect to adults. I do. I think that's a great thing. And, you know, if you train your children to do that, then they're going to give you the respect that you teach them to give to other adults. They will respect you. Look what he says in verse 5. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. What's he saying? Dad's very, hey, get wisdom. You need to get this. You need to make it a goal. Getting wisdom is a lifelong goal. No, no one in here, well, I, once I hit 30, I had all the wisdom. No, wrong. Once I hit 80, nope, you still don't have enough. Keep getting it. Right? That's the goal is to make yourself learn how to get wisdom. Make that a goal throughout your whole life. Keep your finger here. Turn to Psalm 119. Psalm chapter 119. So the dad here is saying, Children, your goal in life is to get godly wisdom. Children, your purpose in life is to learn the wisdom that can only come from God. That's what a father is saying to his children. And that's what the Bible says all throughout. Children, you want to, be, you want to do well when you grow up? Get wisdom. Desire God's wisdom, godly wisdom, the things that can only come from God. Get His instruction, get His knowledge. You're in Psalm 119. I want you to find, which is in the middle of your Bible, look at the middle of the chapter about uh, verse 97. Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Listen, wh why do we memorize verses? Why do we read through the Bible in a year? Why do we recommend you read your Proverbs every day? Get med Meditate on the Word of God. Look what he's saying here. It is my meditation all the day. If you're thinking about godly things, then you're going to meditate it. It's like your brain is sort of chewing on that thought, chewing on these precepts. There are people I know that will keep a New Testament or a small Bible with them, and man, every chance they get, they just... Everybody else is on their phone, thumb, thumb wrestling their phone, right? Playing Bejeweled, checking out Facebook. A wise man would pull out their Bible and get some wisdom from it, meditate on it throughout the entire day. Well, no, I, I get wisdom in the morning. I do my five-minute thing, and then I'm good for the day. No, you're not. Get more. You need more and more and more, and if you meditate on it throughout the day, you will obtain more. You'll have more. Look what he says here, though. Verse number 98. Thou... Through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. Look, you have an enemy in life, man. You have somebody at work that's got it out for you, and they've got more experience than you. All you can do is study the Word of God, get His wisdom. Look what He says, Thou through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies. Lord, I've got enemies. The, the, the devil is sending people to attack you and stop you and cause you to fall or stumble or cause tribulation. And the only way to overcome them is to abide by God's commandments. Get his wisdom in your heart and you'll be better, wiser than your enemies. Look at the next verse. Verse 99. I have more understanding than all my teachers for thy testimonies are my meditation. Hey, homeschool kids, you want to be smarter than your teacher? Meditate on the Bible, right? <laughs> hey, you're at work and they have a boss, they have a manager, meditate on the Bible, learn the Bible, focus on the Bible, and you will be wiser than them. You will be exalted over them. Status doesn't matter. Knowledge doesn't matter. The wisdom of God is what matters. God can open your mind or reveal things or open doors or bless you in ways that you can't even explain if you put Him first. 
if you make the goal of getting wisdom your number one goal in life. Look at verse 100. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. Children, you want to be better than the generation before you? Obey God. Children, you look out here and you see all the strange things going on in the world. You see all the perversions. You see people listening to music that makes them act like a fool. You want to avoid acting like a fool? Meditate on God's precepts. Listen to His law. Abide by His commandments. Seek His wisdom and He will bless you. You'll be better than the next generation. The last generation. You'll be better than the old men that have all these... You go down to the, 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 the university down here. And you say, who has the most degrees? I want the smartest guy you got. Give me somebody with an IQ of 180 that's got doctorates upon masters, upon all these different degrees, and you give me a child that fears the Lord, he can have more wisdom and more blessing from God than that person could ever comprehend. I want you to go back to Proverbs chapter 4. I have more understanding than all my teachers. I understand more than the ancients, and it happens through wisdom. Look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 6 of wisdom. He says, Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Look, he's saying, Fall in love with wisdom. Look, hey, you're in the flesh. You have a problem. You love your flesh. You love the desire of the flesh. You love what makes you feel good, what sounds good, what looks good. The Bible is saying you need to fall in love with wisdom. Well, how do you get wisdom? The beginning of, the, of wisdom, right? It's fearing the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Hey, and get what else? To hate evil. How do you love wisdom? You hate foolishness. You hate wickedness. You hate evil. You hate anything that would get in between you and God. You learn to hate those things and love and desire wisdom above all else. If you fall in love with wisdom and make it your number one goal, God will greatly bless you. Look at verse number seven. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. What's the principal thing? That is the main thing. That is the number one goal. That is the biggest purpose in life. Period. The main goal in your life should be to get wisdom. Well, how do, well how do, that doesn't even make sense. Obviously, I have to have a family. Yeah, but guess what? Without wisdom, you're not going to lead your family right. Well, I got to have a job. I got to have a house. I got to have a car. I got to, I got to, I got to. You got to get wisdom. You got to make wisdom the number one thing, the principal thing. The top thing, captain of your life, ought to be to find the fear of the Lord and obtain wisdom. To have understanding and knowledge of the holy, of the scriptures. Searching for wisdom. God promises you'll get it. He guarantees you'll get it. That needs to be the number one goal in your life. Look, we should all have goals in different ways of our life. And look, we're all in the flesh, so we set fleshly goals. But who has the spiritual goal of getting wisdom? Listen, you need to make your goal. Okay, I need to get wisdom today. You just need to just say, oh, yep, oh, i got to get some wisdom. Let me grab my Bible. Hey, it's wisdom time. Come here, kids. It's wisdom time. Let's get some wisdom together. Listen, make that the principal thing. Meditate on it throughout the day. When you rise up, when you lay down, make it the main thing. Look at verse number 8. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. All right, don't promote yourself. Exalt wisdom, and you'll be promoted by God. Look, it says in verse 9, She shall give to thy head an ornament of grace. A crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. He's saying you can have a long and peaceful life if your goal is to get wisdom, if you fall in love with wisdom. Look at verse 11. The dad here speaking, say, he says, I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in the right paths. Listen, dad, your goal is to be able to say, I taught my children the wisdom of God. Your goal as a dad, as a parent, is to say, I did it the right way. 
Hey, you're going to make mistakes along the way. The goal is to be able to say, I was a good example. I didn't fall out of church. I didn't stop serving God. I didn't stop reading my Bible. I c you should be able at the end of your life to brag and say, I have taught you in the way of wisdom. Yeah. When your children get older and they begin to make their own decisions, and, and they, they come to a, a crossroads and they're asking you for wisdom, you can say, I've taught you in the way of wisdom. You know what you need to do in the situation. Search God first. Get wisdom from God and He will give you the answers. But Dad, you don't get to the end of your life accidentally having done this. You have to make it a goal. You have to purpose in your life. When I'm old, when I'm done, when they're ready to bag me and bury me, right? I can brag and say, I did it God's way. I kept God's word. I gave my kids an example they can live by. Look, parents, you're going to make mistakes. You're, you are going to fall, but will you get back up? You're going to stumble, but will you teach your children how to get through tribulation? That's the goal. To where kids see you on the ups and the downs, and all the way through you maintain your integrity, keeping wisdom, instructing them in wisdom. Amen. Look at verse 12. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened. And when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Can you imagine? Take hold. Hold on to it. Keep her. He's trying to give us some physical words here to help us understand the spiritual understanding that we have to obtain. We've got to fight for wisdom. We've got to love wisdom. It will preserve our life. It will protect us from things. It will get us through hard times. It will help us to raise children that please the Lord. It's the only way. He shifts gears here. He starts to warn about the wicked again like he has in previous chapters. Look what he says in verse 14. Enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. For they sleep not except they have done mischief and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. Turn to Psalm 140, keeping your finger here. Psalm chapter 140. He says, don't go in the way of the wicked. Stay away from evil men. Don't pass by it. Don't turn into it. You need to turn away from it. He says, they're not going to sleep until they hurt somebody. And you think you can run with the world? They'll turn on you and hurt you. The wicked, they don't care who they hurt. They're the children of the devil. Look, there are people that are children of the world that are mixed up with children of the devil. They don't understand the difference. They don't know why. And I've had many people... When, I had a lady that comes to mind recently. I believe I was with Brother Marcel. I could be wrong on that. We're out soul winning and it, it begins to rain. And this lady was coming out of somebody else's house, her boyfriend's house. And it starts to rain, and there was a very small awning, and we stepped under it. And I'm trying to preach her, and she's having a hard time. She says, wait, I just want to know. Like, this faith alone thing, I've got a problem with it. What about Jeffrey Dahmer? What about pedophiles? What about people that molest children? Well, you know, teaching about reprobates and sodomites is not part of your regular soul winning plan. But understanding that doctrine can actually help people. Yeah. I showed her what it I said, look, we're all born neutral. We're children of the world. We're sons of Adam. God brings us into the world. We have choices to make. Do you want to be a son of God? Do you want to be a son of the devil? There are people that are rejected of God because they chose to become a son of the devil. You reject God, God will reject you. These people are capable of all sorts of strange things. Hurting the innocent. Forcing people. Taking away their innocency. I explained that to her and she's like, that makes so much sense. I explain, look, they're taken captive by the devil's will. The devil can come up and just take them and do hurtful things to innocent people. She's just like, that makes so much sense. Yep. Now tell me more. If we preach the gospel, she got saved. It made sense to her that there's a certain category of people that are only out for evil and they can't even help themselves. Their rest is taken away if they don't get to hurt somebody. They're not e at ease until they get to hurt somebody. That's a devil working through somebody. Yeah. Look, this warning is here for a reason. You know, the strange mind of the devil's children is to hurt the innocent. Right? Thank God we're sons of God. We're, we're children of the Lord. But there are people that are children of the devil, once damned, 
always damned. There's no going back. There's a war on for the people in the middle. We're saved. Thank God we have the, privi the privilege, the honor to be able to go and try to save some souls for Christ. Amen. That's part of our job. Look here in Psalm 140. Look at the top. Very, verse number 1. Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man. Listen, violence surrounds the lives of the devilish. There are people I've seen in different area you can tell when when somebody like drug people we rode by and we were out walking and we see a bunch of people and there's like all these strange people and they all look messed up and tattoos and bruises and i'm like drug people what their life is full of violence their house is in disarray their face is bleeding drug people hey look it's not the drugs it's what's in their heart they're walking down the path of violence with evil men then some of those people are mixed up. They get, they get lured in by their own desire, by their own lust, and then the devil gets them. The devil messes with them. Look what he says here. The, Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man. There are people that hate you just because you claim the name of Christ. There are people in this world, they would love nothing more to see you fall. They don't understand the difference between a Catholic or a Christian or a Mormon or any of that. But, you know, they hate God so much, they want to see anybody that's associated with a religion just fall and be hurt. You know, look, look what he says in verse 2. Which imagine mischiefs in their heart. Continually are they gathered together for war. Right, remember it said they sleep not except they have done mischief? It said in Proverbs 4. There's mischiefs. They're imagining mischief, bad things in their heart. Continually they're gathered together for war. They're always ready to go get somebody to do something dishonest, evil, hurtful, foul. Look at verse 3. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. Look, they've prepared words against you they're looking for a fight they want to get you they are deceitful that's why when we're at the door after the second admonition man take a walk you got somebody that's just firing off at you hey just go away you don't have time for that look let alone when it's somebody that just simply isn't interested and they keep telling you you don't don't force your way into into preaching the gospel to somebody if they reject it but all the more when it's a false prophet or somebody cursing at you Give them a chance and then walk away. Okay, we're done. I want nothing to do with you. I'm not going to sit here and, and try to have a debate. And I'm not going to you know, go railing for railing. No time. No need. They have sharpened their tongues. Oh, they're ready. They, they've put all these posts on their Facebook. They hate creation. They hate Christians. And, they, you, know, and, they, and you want to come by and talk to them. They're ready for you. They got all sorts of stuff they want to say to you. Doesn't matter what you say. You can't win them over when they're already like this. He compares them to serpents. Devil's children we're talking about here. Look at verse 4. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violent man who have purposed to overthrow my goings. He's asking for protection. God, there are people that are trying to destroy my life. They want to destroy my finances, my family, my church, my friends. My children, my marriage. He's saying only God can... Look, God, they're physically attacking me. I need some spiritual protection. I need you to guard me. Look what he says in verse 5. The proud have hid a snare for me and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set gins for me. These are physical traps. He, they've literally set these physical traps. They are trying to attack you. And again, we need spiritual protection. Spiritual protection of God can protect you from all sorts of things from the enemy. But look, you've got to be in God's will. You've got, you got to obey God's word. You've got to be seeking after wisdom. You have to tr be trying to be righteous and getting the sin out of your life. God doesn't want to hear the prayer of somebody that's rejected his law. Even if you're saved and you're willfully in sin, you say, I don't care. I'm enjoying it for a season. That's what it says, right? I'm going to enjoy it for a season. God says, okay, let me just take that hedge off. Let me let the enemy come get you till you're down on your knees crying. And then I still might, wait a minute. Look, God is righteous. God is just. There's not one of you in here that says, I am justified. I deserve to be alive right now. Nobody can say that. God can take your life just to save someone else. God can take your life as an example. God can take your life as correction or chastisement. And he can let your enemy do it. 
He can let your enemy glory over your death. <laughs> that Christian, that stupid. <laughs> God can let it happen. But here the prayer is, Lord, protect me from these things. Lord, hear my prayer. Lord, help me to be righteous. Lord, I avoid these wicked people. I avoid the evil. Please protect me. Look at verse 10. What's the prayer? Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits that they rise not up again. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow him. He's actually he's saying, Lord, you go get them. Lord, you deal with them. You saw what they're doing. Lord, they're trying to send the cops after me. Lord, they're trying to sue me. They want to send the IRS after me. They're trying to they're trying to call on my boss. Lord, you deal with them. Lord, would you judge them? I'm not going to go pick up a rock and fight my enemy. I'm going to open my mouth and I'm going to pray to God. God, you're supernatural. You're bigger than them. Would you take care of them? He goes on. He says, let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. He says, not just this enemy. Lord, please stop some of these wicked people. Look, when George Bush Jr. was getting reelected, I prayed against him. He's a wicked man. When Obama was trying to get in office, I prayed against him. He's an evil man. When Donald Trump is trying to get elected, he is a wicked, evil man. He is a pornographer and an adulterer. He is anti-God and anti-America. I wish God would strike him dead. I wish that these evil speakers would not be raised up. I wish there was judgment in the earth. But now's not the time. It's up to God. Look, in the meantime, I'm going to be righteous. I'm going to do what's right in my... And I'm going to trust the Lord to provide everything else. Look at verse 12. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and the right of the poor. He's saying he's our advocate. I know that God will maintain your cause. God, they're destroying me. They're going to take everything I've got. He says, okay, it's okay. I will maintain your cause. Remember what happened to Job? He ended up with more. It's not about stuff, and too many times we let that be the thing. If you ever let stuff get in the way of you and your, your spiritual work for God, God might take that stuff so you're stronger in Him. And sometimes the enemy, even when you are righteous, they're going to come and they want to take all your stuff. They want to take your family. They want to physically hurt you. Job was sitting there in tears with miserable comforters. His three best friends came and said, well, it must be your fault, Job. You did something wrong. You must have cheated somebody. You must have done something wrong, Job. Miserable comforters. He had boils all over his body, so much so that he was just scraping. It's all he could do to feel a little bit better. Lost his children, lost his houses, lost all of his crops, his animals. Gone. Done. That was the devil's work. But yet the Lord maintained his cause. The Lord protected him through that. He came forth as gold when the Lord tried him. When the devil attacked, he didn't come through so well. Right? When, when the world attacked, when his friends attacked, he didn't look so good. He didn't have his reputation. They're falsely accusing him. But as Christians, you maintain a reputation with God in the sense you keep an assured account with God. You do what he says. You please him and don't worry about everybody else. I don't care what it costs you. You do the right thing. Look, he says in verse 12, I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and the right of the poor. Surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name. The upright shall dwell in thy presence. Go back to Proverbs 4. Hey, thank God he's always with us. We're going to dwell in his presence. But he says here, the righteous shall give thanks unto his name. What did Job do when he was tried? He fell down and worshipped. Naked, naked came I into the world, naked shall I leave. Hey, blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, what are you going to do? You got this bit. Hey, it's, you know what? God will get me through it. Yeah, but what if you lose your stuff? It's all right. They can't take my soul. I'm going to please him who could take my soul. I'm going to do what's right before him. Maybe this is a test. Maybe it's the devil attacking. I don't know. I don't want to falsely accuse God and say, God, why are you doing this to me? I don't want to give the devil any more credit than he deserves and say, De well, it's the devil's fault either. Just take it and just move on in life. Life is a roller coaster. There's ups and downs. Everybody has ups and downs in their lives. Everybody is going to go through hard times. And it's okay. God is still on the throne. God will give you the victory if you'll let Him. But look, He wants you to get stronger and stronger and stronger through each of these trials. If you tuck tail and run, oh, I got the first sign of adversity. Oh, no. They're, they're, oh, my boss found out I go to this church. I think I'm going to have to quit coming to church. Go now. 
Don't be a coward then. Just leave. If you got a problem with hard preaching, you got a problem with God's Word, don't sit around and have your ears tickled. Go. Listen, make a stand now. Determine that God's Word is more important and His wisdom is the only thing that can protect your family. Make that determination now. Fall in love with getting wisdom. And, and when trials come, it's not going to matter. Well, we knew trials would come. Thank God He sees us worthy and fit to go through this trial. Otherwise, He wouldn't allow it to come to me. Knowing that God will bring you through. God wants to give you an opportunity to succeed and have a victory. And too many times we're just, oh, what are we going to do? Let's run. Don't run. Stand. Be steadfast. Look at verse 14. Proverbs 4, 14. Enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of the evil man. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. He says, don't even look at it. You're walking down and you see some strange people. Oh, look at those tattooed freaks. Wow, isn't that weird? No, don't look at that. Look, you see somebody dressed inappropriately, man, woman. You see somebody that's dressed with their clothes hanging out. Look, don't look at it. Don't pay attention to it. Don't let those things go in your eyes, go down into your heart. You need to stand and fight against this stuff. I used to have somebody that would send me videos. All, oh, look at this, this Miley Cyrus. Oh, look, Madonna, really? Hey, I don't, I don't want to see it. It's filth. What's it going to prove to me? Yep, she serves the devil. In the meanwhile, I had to defile my mind and look at that filth. Don't look at it. Don't waste your time with it. Look at the Bible instead. Look, if you spend all your time hunting down the next conspiracy, oh, I, if I can just get my hands, if I can just finally prove, hey, right here, this is what you need. This is the wisdom that will preserve your life. If you're worried about debunking the world or showing who's, who's good, who's bad, look, they're all evil. If they're in politics, they're evil. If they're part of a mega church, they're evil. They're wicked. Just settle it. Why don't you read about men like Job? Read about John the Baptist. Look what Jesus did. Look what Paul did. Idolize them. Esteem them. Right? Hold God up in His Word and say, this is what I need to pay attention to. Not be, oh, I know they're so evil. If I can just keep watching it, maybe I'll find that secret thing. Shut up. It's a waste of your time. And look, I know there are conspiracies. I, I'm not a conspiracy denier. I am a conspiracy realist. I know it's real. The Bible talks about conspiracies. It's happened since the beginning, and it's going to happen to the end. It's okay. I can't stop the New World Order. But in the meantime, I will preach the gospel. We will save souls. We will raise up children that will fight on our behalf. They'll stand against the enemies in the gate. That's the goal. Look what he says in verse 16. Warning about these reprobates. He says, For they sleep not, except they have done mischief. And their sleep is taken away unless they call some to fall. These people are possessed with evil. They're reprobates. They sleep not unless they call some to fall. They are just crafty, mischievous. They want to hurt people. They probably can't even explain why. They couldn't even tell you what their desire is. But they know they want to do something. They got to find something. You know, in Micah 7, it says that they may do evil with both hands earnestly... The prince asketh, and the judge asketh for a reward. And the great man, he uttereth his mischievous desire, so they wrap it up. He's saying in the Old Testament, the courts are crooked. The lawyers are crooked. The politicians are crooked. But you know what? God rules. God's in charge. They don't matter. I don't care how bad it gets out there. It's not yet. The time is not yet. And it's going to get weirder and weirder and weirder. And what's he say? Settle it therefore in your hearts. Look, be patient, be calm, have wisdom, make that the standard. Help that. That'll help you maintain. Look at verse 17. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The wine of violence. Did you know wine makes you violent? Do you know drugs make you violent? Do you know drinking alcohol makes you violent? If you don't believe me, ask any cop. There are so-called Christians today, especially in the Calvinist camp, that love to try to argue and say, well, it's okay to drink. Jesus turned water into wine. Wine means juice. The question is, is it alcoholic juice or is it non-alcoholic juice? Look, I would say the juice of violence is probably alcoholic, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you agree a juice that makes you violent and hurt people? That's a drug. You lose your sobriety. You do things you regret. You say things you couldn't even believe that you did. And, and any Christian that would say, well, it's okay to drink wine just a little bit. I take one glass. You know, look, that is wicked. That is not right. 
And, and they get boldness. People get boldness from drinking. Brother Jeff brought this up. I mentioned, yeah, they call it liquid courage. Right? It's not courage. It's liquid stupidity. It is liquid foolishness. It's called the wine of violence. If you drink alcohol, you will do things you regret. You will violate people. You will hurt people. You will hurt yourself and not even know how. You'll wake up and say, what happened to me? Proverbs 23. How'd this happen? Yet I will seek it again. Look, today in this generation, we need to stand against wine. Wine is the opposite of wisdom. These two things are inseparable. If you take wine, I don't care how much wisdom you have, it's all out the window. Why is it they call it spirits? Because you've opened yourself to an influence of a spirit. You forsake God's wisdom, and you pick up alcoholic wine, and you consume it. Oh, it's just one. It's just a little. It's just for my heart. I just take these pills. I just smoke this weed. It's wrong. It's wicked. It's going to cause you to do stupid things. There are Christians today that are not blessed of God because they try to justify their sin. They try to change the scriptures and say that drunkenness is somehow okay. They try to, well, it doesn't say meth is in the Bible, so go ahead, right? Look, it's wicked. Any drug, anything that makes you not sober is wicked. Amen. Children, how do you be wise? You avoid wine, beer, pot, meth, heroin, cocaine. I don't even have to name them all. Anything that affects your mind. Anything that affects your sobriety. It's called the wine of violence. It's the children of the devil that have to have it. And they want you to come run with them. Just come one night. It'll be fun. We'll have a good time. We'll go meet some new people. You can just drink a little and don't worry. We'll take care of you. We'll babysit you. We'll bring you up under our wing. And next thing you know, you're the one that they're violating. That they're forcing. The one that they have to hurt before they can go to bed. You're the one that loses all your money. You're the one that wakes up with a bruise. You're the one that wakes up with your head hurting because you've been poisoned and you don't even know why. What is going on? It's called poison. It's poisoning your body. God did not intend for human beings to get drunk. Wine was used in, in the past as a medicine. Meth, or not meth, but uh, heroin is a derivative of a medicine. Hey, even marijuana, yes, it's a medicine. But if, if somebody said, hey, come hang out with me and my buddies. We're going to ride around. We're going to meet some new people. We're going to crunch up some Tylenol and snort it. You'd say, what? What in the hell is wrong with you? That's not right. That's terrible. You're poisoning yourself. That's the wine of violence. That's the wine of violence. It destroys lives. It gives you boldness. It, it, let, it opens you up to a demonic influence gives you boldness to do the things that God's wisdom would warn you otherwise about. Avoid people that do this sort of thing. Look at verse number 18. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Look at this. This is a cool verse. We're going to read it again. But the path of the just, these are the saved, is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Listen, God's people saved Israel. It was says that they were a covenant for the people, that they were a light unto the Gentiles. The nation of Israel was established to be a light unto the Gentiles, to preach the gospel. They were a missionary nation. They failed. They failed miserably. They perverted the gospel. They made it all about the law. The Pharisees were in charge. I mean, they were hurting the innocent. All, everything was in disarray. God judged them. It should be no wonder. And even when Jesus came along, he said, ye are the light of the world. Right? So Jesus, to his disciples, the ones that are saved, he said, now you are the light of the world. They were the light of the Gentiles. They were the light of the world. I'm taking it from them. I'm giving this blessing to you. Right? The Bible says that we have the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. How are we the light of the world? By this. This is how we shine the light. This is your flashlight. This is your torch. Look, the, the dark runs from the light. We are the light of the world. We have the glorious gospel of Christ. It is the light of the world. In John 3 he says, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and man loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Why do people hate the Bible? Why do they hate God? Why do they hate churches? Because the Bible says you shouldn't live like that. You shouldn't do that. Even in John the Baptist day, he said, hey, you, you can't sleep around with somebody like that. You can't take another man's wife. That's wicked. He lost his head over it. He took a stand on adultery. He died for preaching adultery. 
And today it's like you even mentioned that being a queer is not normal. And they're like, oh, how dare you? We're going to cut you up. We're going to protest you. Think about it. No, Jesus said by their tradition, they've made his law of no effect. Well, we don't do things like that anymore. It's all salt and light. Yeah, what's the light? The gospel. What's the gospel include? There is a hell. It's real. It's eternal. It's fire and torment forever. Shine that light. Set the captives free. Look at verse 18 where he says, The path of the just, the path of the just, the saved. He says, Shineth more and more unto the perfect day. What is the perfect day? I mean, you might, well, I had a pretty good day last week. I wouldn't call it a perfect day. No, that's not what it means, right? As we shine more and more, as we get more of God's wisdom in our heart, His Word in our mind, we can become perfect. Look, I'm not saying sinless perfection. That doesn't exist. That's a lie. You're always going to sin. Perfect means complete. God's goal is that you would obtain perfection, completeness, obedience, usefulness to God. And one day you'll stand before Him and be judged. That's the perfect day. Hey, you know the day that you don't sin, that's a perfect day, right? When is that day? The day you're out of here. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, right? And until then, we need to shine brighter and brighter and brighter until we get to that perfect day. For we all shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us will stand and be judged, and that's going to be the perfect day. Even if you don't have a lot of rewards, the perfect day is when you don't have to worry about this flesh dragging you down anymore. And in the meantime, live like a king and a priest of God. Live righteously. Tell people what His law says. Preach the gospel and get them saved. Look at verse 19. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. They don't even understand why they're having problems. They love darkness. They hate God, and they don't understand why they have all these problems in life. Why is my life always violent? Why are my family? Why is my family in disarray? What did it say? Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Look at verse 20. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. You've got to get the Bible in your heart. Listen, and this is important. I want to say this. Thank God for concordances. Thank God for, you know, just technology today. I probably have 30 Bibles in my house. I have different types and flavors and old ones and new ones and soft cover and hard cover. I got all sorts of pocket Bibles and pulpit Bibles. And you know what? I've got to get it in my heart. Look, having the Bible on your bookshelf does you no good. But you know what doesn't do you any good either? Trusting in your smartphone. Have it. Well, you know, oh yeah, what is that verse? Let me look it up. And look, hey, I'm guilty like the rest of us. Thank God we have digital tools. We can look up verses. And, you know, oh, I can find it quicker. Right? Knowledge is increasing more and more. You preachers are good preachers. You men do some good preaching because you have these tools. But a better thing is to put this wisdom in your heart. To make sure you're reading it enough. Finding the verses that you say, man, that's one of the ones I need up here always. So with the day when the cops kick in the door and take this, when, when Google shuts off your smartphone, when Apple discontinues the apps with the Bible on it, you've got it in here. Look, thank God for the smartphones. Thank God for the concordance, the technology, the, the plethora of Bibles that are printed. But you better get in your heart because one day you're going to be without any of that and you're going to wish you had more. Can you imagine if they locked you up tomorrow for being a Christian? And we're all sitting in the jail cells. Somebody starts singing a hymn, and you're like, I remember the tune, I don't know the words, hey, learn it. Can you imagine if you're the only one that has any Bible memorized, and you can just start quoting it? You just close your eyes and read the Word of God from inside your heart to your brothers and sisters and comfort them. Look, you men that study the Word and memorize the Word, can you imagine the day when somebody puts you on the spot and they say, we need a sermon on something? Brother Marcel says, hey, I got, I got Hebrews 3 memorized, open up to Hebrews 3. I'll teach you what it means, that's sermon enough. That's the Word of God being shared out of your heart. These are the goals that we ought to have because we cannot trust on the physical things. In fact, one day, those things will not be available to us. Look at verse 22. For they, that's God's Word, are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. You'll be a more healthy person when you study the Word, when you get His wisdom in your heart. Keep thy heart with all diligence... For out of it are the issues of life. This is a very important verse. 
If there's one verse I want you to remember from this whole chapter, it's this right here. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. In Philippians 4 it says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God will protect your mind. Your mind and your heart, that's where you, the thoughts happen. That's who you really are. Those are the things you retain. That's your personality. And he's saying, control, protect, keep your heart, guard your heart, because all of the issues of life come out of it. If the devil can put a little bit of leaven in your heart, a little bit of poison, a little bit of sympathy for the evil man, the evil woman, if you have sympathy for a wicked person, then you're not keeping your heart. Think about it. All the issues of life come out of it. All understanding is passed by God and protects our heart. And the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us into all truth. But are you grieving God? Are you grieving the Holy Spirit with your television? Are, are you guarding your heart to where when you sit in a restaurant and you see that TV, and you know, I, I hate TVs. I mean, I work in video. I used to have a television show. I know a lot. I mean, the technology is there to hypnotize you. The frame rate is there to hypnotize you. And I, I can't tell you how many times my wife and I are at a, at a restaurant, and I started looking. She's like, Adam, Adam, what? What was going on? Like a bug zapper. I'm just drawn to the light. What are you watching? Watching basketball. I don't, what? I, I didn't even know I was looking at it. Look, it's there to hypnotize you. It's there to deceive you. It wants to get in your heart. And there are people that live and breathe and die and go to sleep with their TV on. They trust it for everything. You know, there was a marketing study done, and they said that seeing a well-produced video about a product is equally on par with getting a referral from a very good friend. If one of you came up to me and said, hey, uh, this Four Rivers barbecue restaurant is the best I've ever seen. I mean, their corn is, their brisket. I'd say, okay, wow, okay, I trust this from a friend. But guess what? A YouTube video has the same power. A TV show has the same power. When he says, keep your heart, out of it come the issues of life, next thing you know, you're recommending the restaurant. You've never even been there. Imagine, think about it. That's the power of what goes into your heart. Once it's in there, you're convinced of it, and now you're putting it back out. Are you grieving God with your phone, with your Facebook, with your Instagram, with your YouTube? Fill in the blank. Whatever it is, do you spend more time thumb wrestling some device, looking at other people's drama and their photos, coveting after things that don't belong to you, than you do searching the Word of God? He's saying get this in your heart because out of your heart comes the issues of life. And if you spend two hours a day on Facebook, guess what affects your heart? Well, I mean, I know Facebook's bad, but, you know. And that old person, I know they're bad, but, you know. Look, it's changing your heart. It's changing your mind about doctrine. The issues of life is supposed to be based on doctrine. Not on a whim. Not on emotions. Look, the Holy Spirit is there to guide us and lead us and show us things to come. And we ignore Him, we grieve God, and we choose technology. He wants to protect you and preserve you from perversion. Are you fighting against His will? I mean, the Holy Spirit's there. Hey, don't look at that. Don't go there. Don't click on that. Not that. What are you doing? Well, it's just this one thing. I just want to see, you know, maybe I'm just a little curious. Maybe I, No. Your heart is valuable. You need to understand your mind is very important. And if you don't defend your mind, if you don't put the shield up, put your guard up, put your dukes up, get ready to fight against the devil because he's coming at you. And, he, and he's not coming with a sword. He's coming with a piece of candy. Oh, look at that. Look, he's got you. Look, that's how the devil works. He wants to get into your heart so you will change your doctrine. Look what he says in verse 24. Put away from thee a froward mouth. A, a froward means crooked, right? He says, put away from thee a froward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. He's not just saying, walk away from a bad joke. He's saying, put them away. Hey, man, did you hear the one about, hey, shut up. I don't want to hear that. Yeah. Don't use those words around me. I don't want to hear them. I don't want them going in my heart. I don't want it coming out of my mouth. I'm trying to protect my heart. I don't want to say that in front of my children. Don't say it in front of me. 
Look, your standard ought to be the same at work that it is at home. Well, I know, you're the boss and you got the funny joke. It's a little bit dirty. Hey, can you do me a favor? Please don't say that. Look, my ears are delicate. My heart, I need to guard it. I don't want to say that in front of my children. It would break my heart to say such a thing. Can you do me a favor and just don't include me when you tell that joke, when you tell another joke? What about a dirty song on the radio? That's my song. That's my jam. You don't know. I go way back. My wife and I met. We, I used to listen to that back when I was in high school. I used to listen to that music. Look, what's, what's he say here? Put away from thee a froward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. Most of, most of the music industry is full of perverts. Straight up perverts. If they're not a, if, if they're not a queer, they're probably a pedophile. Right? Or, or they're in the middle of something weird. I mean, so many of them openly say they sold their soul to the devil. I don't know that they can do that, but they can certainly make a, a decision to become a son of the devil. And that's what the, I don't, I don't care if they signed the contract, it was in their heart that it happened. Why? Because they didn't protect their heart. Why? Because they didn't love the things of God. Well, those are the people that they put forth that play that fiddle to try to lull you to sleep. They want to play that rhyme, play that song to get into your ears. Look, we as Christians need to stand against the music of today. Yes, right. And it starts on a personal level. Turn it off. Well, but I, I just listened to some old country western. It's not that bad. It's just as bad. It's blasphemous. It's wicked. It is just as bad. There is no genre of music you can tell me is acceptable in God's eyes. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. That's how we learn doctrine. That's how we teach children. Have that melody in your heart of the Lord, right? Here he's saying, put them away. Don't listen to stuff. Oh, well, I, I just like reading these romance novels. Women, put it up. That's a sin. That's wicked. You read those words. You put it down in your heart. It makes you think thoughts that are not right. Well, I got these old Facebook friends and they like to... No, shut them up. Put them away from you. Their mouth is crooked. Their words are perverse. You don't need them. God will give you better friends. Look at the next verse. Let thine eyes look right on. And let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Turn to Psalm 101, keeping your finger here. We're almost done. Psalm chapter 101. Let thine eyes look right on. Let thine eyelids look straight before thee. He's saying look at righteous things. Not perversion. Reject the whoredoms of the world. Reject the bad things that the devil wants to put in front of you. You know, in Job 31, he starts out the chapter by saying, I have made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Job, who's in the middle of his tribulation and his trial, he's not justifying himself. He's saying, I obeyed God's law. I'm doing what God said. I only love my wife. I've only got eyes for my wife. Yeah, but you don't understand, brother, fan, of being in the flesh. No, no, everybody's in the flesh. Your wife's in the flesh, too. You think she's not tempted to look at things she shouldn't look at? Job is saying, I did the right thing. I made a covenant when I got married. My eyes belong to her. And if I have a problem, I need to say, God, help me to love my wife. God, help me to hate the things that are going to get in between my, my wife and I. Why then should I look upon a maid? Don't look at other people. Hey, and if you're married, cover up your nakedness. If you're married, you need to make sure that you're covering up the parts of your body that only belong to the other. Don't be showing off your body. Men, don't be taking off your shirt. Ladies, don't be wearing low cut. Don't be wearing short shirts. That's not right in the sight of God. Your body belongs to your husband or your wife. And if you're single and you say, well, this doesn't apply, let me tell you something. If you're single, do not make the excuse. That's okay. I can look now. I'm just shopping. One day I'll find. No, you need to make a covenant right now. And you say, God, I don't want to look at the whoredoms of the world. I want to look at righteous women. Look, you single men, you need to decide right now. Don't fall in love with looking at bad things because that's your heart. It's no longer protected. I had somebody email me recently and they were trying to justify looking at, looking at filthy images on the, on the internet because there's no sin. It's not adultery. I'm not married, right? It's all good, isn't it? I, and this was in the middle of the night. This was like 2 in the morning and I was still up. I was working. and I, I fired back a dozen verses at this guy real quick. Look, men... Don't lust after things that don't belong to you, right? The Bible says no whore or nor sodomite. There are people that do that sort of thing and put those images out there, and they are God-haters. They are children of the devil, and what do they want to do? They want to get you. 
They want to get in your heart. And you can't look at one side of those images without seeing the other side. That stuff is polluting your mind. Look, if there's anybody in here that has a problem with that, you need to determine right now that you want to hate it. You've got to beg God to help you to hate that filth. You need to love your wife. You need to love your children. You say, I don't, I don't have a wife. I don't have children. I'm not married. Then you need to decide right now that if you're ever going to find a Proverbs 31 woman, you need to start being a Job 31 man. You need to make a covenant right now and say, before God, I want to do the right thing. He sees what I see. He knows what I'm thinking about. He knows what I'm lusting after. God, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm busted and the Holy Spirit reveals it to me, I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. Lord, I live in fear of you. I want to do the right thing. Why would God give you one of his daughters? If you're looking at a bunch of whores of the devil, children of the devil, defiling themselves for money, if that's all you're looking after, then your heart is going to go after that. But if you determine, hey, you know what, I'm going to put the blinders on, even though I'm not married, I'm just going to trust God to give me a good, righteous wife. I want a Proverbs 31 woman. I want to be a Job 31 man. I'm going to make a covenant with my eyes. I'm not going to think on a maid. I'm going to think on godly things. Look, you're in Psalm 101. And you think about it, just as much as he said, look not upon the wine. Don't look at anything that would cause you to stumble. Yeah. Psalm 101, look at verse number 3. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Do you know how these images don't cleave to him? He hates it. I hate the work of them that turn aside. Instead of following Christ, those that turn aside, hey, sin lieth at the door. You walk through that door, I hate your works. I hate what you're involved. I hate your music. I hate your images. I hate your movies. I don't want it in my mind. I don't want it in my heart. I don't need that doctrine. I need this doctrine. This is the only thing that helps. No wicked thing. He says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Well, I know the person, I mean, they're playing a married couple in the movie. That's okay. No, they're probably both sodomites in real life. They work for a bunch of Zionist God-haters. And what are they doing? With subtlety, they want to teach you, send your children off to the world. It's okay to be queer. It's okay to lie, to cheat, to commit adultery. Everything works out by the end of the movie. It always works out. Look, it's, it's doctrine. It's not just entertainment. They're entrancing you. It's an enchantment. It's witchcraft. Look at verse number 6. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. What's he saying here? Hey, I, I want my eyes to be on the good people, the good things. I'm in a restaurant and we have a problem. I have a universal remote in my truck. If you don't have one, you can go get one for about 10 bucks at Walmart. And it's real simple. You just start programming. Oh, there it goes. Done. Now, if I could figure out how to put some Pastor Anderson or Pastor Romero or Pastor Jimenez up on the screen, boy, I'd do that. I, my eyes would be on the faithful of the land, and the people around would be like, oh, he just said what? And I'm like, yeah, get him. <laughs> $10 universal remote, the best investment you'll ever have if you like to go out and eat at restaurants, because then you can shut them up. Look, ask them, can you turn that off? Can you turn that away? Can you change that? Can you put the home shopping network on? Don't put that filth. Let, let me covet after diamonds rather than watching the polluted, you know, the reality shows. It's all a bunch of wickedness. The path of the just, what's he say? Shineth more and more unto that perfect day. Get it out of your life. Get, sanctify yourself. Purge yourself. Judge yourself so God doesn't have to judge you. That's the goal. So God doesn't have to come down hard on you. When you mess up, judge yourself. Lord, I did it again. I'm so sorry. Help me to grow. Help me to get through it. Help me to be a bigger man. Help me to be an example to my family. He's merciful. He's long-suffering. But if you stiffen your neck, you harden your heart, you grieve the Holy Spirit, ah, you know, it's okay. It's just a little bit of sin. Hey, it's fun for a season, right? Woe unto you. Woe unto you. You're letting leaven in the camp. Look at verse number 7. Psalm 101, verse 7. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. You think about it. TV is nothing but a bunch of liars, storytellers. They call them professional liars. You're an actor. Oh, you're a professional liar. Boy, that's honorable. Why don't we make you somebody that children look up to? 
will make you a hero, for they love your face so much. No, if you said this is the toothpaste to use, for their life they would use that. Well, this is the, I like this doctor, I like this product. Oh, that's all I can have. I got to eat those chips. I got to have those tennis shoes. Why? Because what some possessed doubt, some wicked person said this is the way to go. And you love their face more than you love the Word of God. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. Well, I just watched the History Channel. It's very informative. It's historically accurate. Oh, right, yeah. Right, like when they show you that aliens actually made the pyramids. History, of course. Bunch of idiots, man. These reality shows are some of the worst perversions on TV. Look, they've got your favorite... They've got your, your, your flavor. They've got the blend that you like. They've got the people that you like. These reality shows have something for everybody. Well, I don't like Ellen, but, I, you know, I like Oprah. Okay, well, she's a devil. They're both devils. I don't care what reality show you watch. It's full of people with devils glorifying the flesh, glorifying the works of, of the devil, wickedness. Don't put it in front of your eyes. Look, if you still have a TV, man, throw it out, smash it up, and then shoot it. Burn it. Put it in the trash can tonight. Praise God that you have the wisdom to see that there's a problem there. But you don't know. I just like to relax and sit back and pump doctrine into your mind straight from the devil. With subtlety is what the serpent does. Just a little bit at a time where eventually one day you're like, well, I don't know. I think queers are okay. It's okay if they teach Sunday school. You'd be like every other church. Look, we don't want them here. We don't want TVs here. I don't want a TV in your home. If you have one, don't come confess it to me. Just deal with it. You deal with it. God says not to put anything wicked in front of your eyes. Go back, go back to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Look at verse number 26. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Ponder, right? Think about it. Where are you going? Consider what your goal is. How are you establishing things? Ponder, think about it, meditate on it. Where have you been going? What have you been doing? Right? What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Here he's saying, ponder your path. Where's your feet going? What do you expect out of it? What's your goal? If you don't have a goal, you'll hit it. You'll hit nothing. You'll, you'll accomplish nothing. He says, let all thy ways be established in righteousness. The goal is to please the Lord. And the goal is to be acceptable unto Him, to stand before Him in righteousness, knowing that you obeyed His Word, knowing that He will bless you when you obey Him, and He will correct you when you disobey. Look at verse 27. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Remove thy foot. That is an active word. It's not just saying, well, if you get a chance, don't go back there. No, it's saying, turn around right now. Turn away. Remove. Get yourself. At, hey, rebuke them. Get them out of your house. If they won't, if you can't get away from them, then you go. You, hey, you know what? I'm out of here. This doesn't matter. I'm not going to stand and listen to this. I'm not going to stand and look at this. I don't need these things in my life. I have a family to lead. I don't want the devil infiltrating my mind through his subtlety, through his deception, through his lust. Don't look. Don't turn. He says, hey, don't fall. That's, what, that's the next step. The devil wants to cause you to fall. Look, you have to plan to avoid the devices of the devil. You have to plan to avoid nudity in the world. It's everywhere. Ladies, you see somebody with their shirt off, don't look twice. Men, you see somebody dressed inappropriate, plan on not looking. God help me to not look. Put the blinders on. Look, you have to plan to avoid satanic music. If that means you need to wear headphones in the grocery store so you don't hear Elton John while you're shopping for veggies, do it. Put some hard preaching on. Don't let that trash get down in your mind. Every time I've heard a song that I knew in the grocery store, it's like, man, I haven't heard this in 15 years. I used to sing these lyrics, and now that I have some wisdom of God in my life, I recognize the error of it. I can't believe I was such a fool back then to sing this. You have to plan to avoid the seductiveness of drunkenness. You have to plan to avoid drinking or drugging at all costs. I don't care who it is. I don't care how far back we go. I'm gonna, hey, I don't do that anymore. Nope, sorry, I don't do that anymore. But let me tell you what I do do. Let me show you what, what I am. I am addicted to the ministry of the saints. I am addicted to giving the gospel to people and releasing them out of this bondage of the, of the punishment for their sin. 
Look, you have to plan to avoid the enchanting wickedness of television or YouTube or Hulu. You fill in the blank. I don't know what kind of device or app you have, but stuff that comes through video that goes in your eyes and gets in your mind and stays with you for years can pollute you. You have to plan against it. You have to make an attack. You don't just put up a defensive. You need to make an attack. You need to go against it. Say, I'm getting it out of here. I'm cleaning it up. I want to be righteous in God's eyes. I want God's blessing. And the only way that's going to happen is for you to fall in love with wisdom. You need to decide right now that when your father tells you how to get the doctrine, you obey it. Search after doctrine. Search after wisdom. And plan against the wiles of the devil. Defend yourself. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the book of Proverbs. Lord, thank you for just all the wisdom and knowledge and understanding that can be found in your word. Lord, we love you. We come here so that we can be made better. Lord, we come to church because we want to be good Christians. Lord, we read your word because we want to know your will in our life. But Lord, there's a struggle in the flesh. There's a war in our members. Lord, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit and through the power of preaching your word that you would help us to know what decisions we need to make and give us the power to stick with those decisions. Lord, we love you. We love the families. Lord, we love the singles. We, we love the, the Christians that are here that want to be better Christians. Lord, and help us to hate the wickedness of the world that would try to separate us from you. Lord, thank you for this church. I pray that you would bless the rest of our time together tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.